Yeah, and now let's actually show the mechanism for that. You might need to step back for a second and remind yourself what's the mechanism for this E2. Yeah. It helps to label the alpha carbon. Oh, yeah. But remember that the, you're actually going to be taking the hydrogen from the beta carbon. We're going to be taking the hydrogen from the beta carbon. So remember, for elimination, it's very helpful to label both the alpha and the beta carbons. That's That would be a good idea. That's still going to be important on the yeah. final. Yes. Um, now let's show the mechanism. Yeah. Right. The convention is that this arrow, the tail, should be on the negative charge. And then we saw this is a pretty complicated mechanism because we get three arrows concertedly. We can show the intermediate from that step. Now take your time drawing that intermediate. Remember that if we really understand electron pushing arrows, they should always tell us very straightforwardly exactly what the product looks like. So what are the electron pushing arrows telling us about the product? And what was the other product from that step? Minus. Good. And what was the other product, the other intermediate from that step? Good. Now we have the, the hydrogen on there. Mm -hmm. So going through the steps here, what does this arrow tell us? Well, this arrow tells us that we're forming a new bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. This is at the initial tail, so it should change its charge. Its charge should go from negative to neutral. This arrow tells us that we are taking the electrons out of this bond and using them to form a pi bond. And this arrow tells us that the bromine is breaking off. And what's the other charge we're going to change? Well, at the final head. The bromine is at the final head, so it changes the negative charge. So I think the mistake you were making was putting a positive charge over here. And the reason why someone might do that is simply because they're trying to draw a picture that maybe looks like what they've seen before. We've seen other pictures with carbocations. But we're not trying to draw something that looks similar to what we've seen before. We have to just obey the arrows. Um, the arrows are our dictators. They tell us exactly what we're going to do. They don't just tell us what to do with the bonds. They also tell you exactly what to do with the charges. So the charges, there is no guesswork with the charges. The arrows always tell us exactly what to do with the charges. The atom at the initial tail always becomes one step less negative, and the atom at the final head always becomes one step more negative, and there are no other changes to the charges. Since this atom is not at the initial tail or the final head, it's just in the middle of the arrows, its charge shouldn't change. So the charges are based not on what we kind of expect or have seen before, but simply what the arrows tell us to do. And this is the interesting intermediate over here. Is that just E2? Pardon? This is E2, because how many steps are there in an E2 reaction? One step. Well, we've shown this as a one-step reaction. Do you have to, if I, so if I'm doing a synthesis reaction, um, I would put on the line tert-butyl oxide. Yeah, so if you were going to write this for the answer, you would show here that you've got tert-butyl oxide. That's right. Is there a solution that it's usually in? You mean the solvent? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I would just use an aprotic solvent. Maybe, uh, maybe THF would, would work okay. You want an aprotic solvent because you don't want to protonate your base here. Okay, now that we have this intermediate, what do we need to do to the intermediate to get this? Right. Uh, hydrogen to the more substituted carbon, and then swap it out for an OH. So what are the reagents we're going to add in this step? Um, boring and THF, and then after that, um, hydrogen dioxide and hydrogen oxide.
actually, I should call these steps two and three, because we've already done step one. And we don't need to draw the product, because this is the product. So you're drawing the mechanism? Okay, good. Okay, so you actually went through some of the extra steps there. You showed how the boron here would attack concertedly. Why does the boron end up on the right and not on the left? Steric hindrance. Steric hindrance. And that also explains then why the OH ends up on the right, because it's just replacing the boron. We didn't form any stereocenters here, so we didn't have to worry about the fact that this was a SID addition. We could just focus on the regiochemistry. So what was the answer? The answer would be first terpene oxide, then boron and THF, and then hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide. All of this other stuff we wrote down here was just thought process that helps us to get to the synthesis. Mm -hmm. Technically, you, don't have, you usually don't have to show these intermediates to get credit for a synthesis, but you should show them anyway just to make sure that you're thinking through things right. And in fact, it's good to do the mechanisms too. So now would be a good time, uh, like you said, to go back and review E2 reactions. Those are still going to be important on the final exam as well. This is a complicated reaction. You need both the alpha and the beta carbons. Here's the structure of this terpenal oxide, which is very useful for syntheses. So we want to remember that for syntheses. Now, how would you know on the test to use an elimination here? Well, the big clue is, one thing that would have been helpful here is if we had numbered the carbons. And then something that would jump out at us is that how is the product different from the starting material? Well, not only are we changing from a bromine to an alcohol, we're changing the position of the functional group. The functional group is shifting from the number two carbon to an adjacent carbon. The functional group is changing from the number two carbon to the number three, which is adjacent. Well, we talked about this last time. We talked about this last time. How can you shift functional groups between adjacent carbons? Well, elimination is an excellent way to do that because the elimination forms a pi bond between two adjacent carbons. And now since we have the pi bond between the number two and the number three, now we can put the next functional group on either the two or the three based on whether we use a Markovnikov or an anti-Markovnikov addition. So that's an important trick to keep in mind for the exam. And the only way that you would notice this is if you're numbering. If you're numbering, you would notice that not only do we have to put in an alcohol, but it's on a different carbon that the functional group started on. It's on the adjacent carbon. That's an excellent clue that you need to start with an elimination. If um, the final product ended up being with the OH on the second carbon, right? you could still do elimination, but then just do um, the sulfuric acid, right? Then you can do the sulfuric acid in water. That's right. However, in that case, there might be easier ways to make an alcohol. Yeah. There are other ways that you can make an alcohol as well, mm -hmm. besides uh, using an elimination reaction. But the elimination reaction seems good. Again, the key point that I wanted to make is that if you're switching functional groups between adjacent carbons, a good way to do that is with an elimination. I think there's a, actually a section in the second language book that talks about that. 
using eliminations to switch. There's a, a good section in the chapter that talks about synthesis techniques using alkenes. That's good preparation for the exam. And I this think is I one of the tricks. There. Yeah, so you'll get to that shortly. Okay.